Welcome to the Pacific Research Institute's Next Round Podcast. I'm Romina Itchon, COO, and with me, as always, is Tim Anaya, Vice President of Marketing and Communications. So, Tim, we have a new speaker, Robert Revis, and it's the end of it's the end of a Rendon era. Revis comes from the Central Valley, represents the 29th District of Salinas and Pajaro. He was first elected to the Assembly in 2018, and now for listeners who might not be familiar with the controversy earlier this year that kind of led to him assuming office this month. So Tim, how about filling us on on that? Well, our our listeners will remember, uh, certainly last summer we were talking all, all, all about this. So the speakership battle actually began a little more than a year ago when uh, Mr. Rivas generated what he thought was enough votes to get himself elected Speaker of the Assembly. And traditionally, kind of how it goes, um, when you bring a letter signed by a majority of the caucus to the the current Speaker, well, then you schedule a vote and elect that person the next Speaker. Well, the weird thing about it was we didn't have a vote, and we didn't have a vote for a long time because it was clear that Yes, Mr. Rivas may have had um, a majority or close to it of Democrats. He didn't have 41 votes to get elected speaker on the floor of the assembly. And that's an important thing to remember. The speaker is elected by the whole house and you need 41 out of 80 votes to get elected. So um, there then kind of came to be really a, a cold war, for lack of a better term, from last summer all throughout the elections last year. And it was somewhat resolved last November. So after the elections, every two years, the Republican and Democratic caucuses meet and they elect their party leadership. And so they had another formal vote after the election and Rivas was formally elected as speaker, but not right away. He was elected as speaker to take office um, at the end of June, 2023. So During that time, you had an outgoing Speaker Rendon who had very bitter feelings about um, sort of being pushed out before he was ready to go. Mr. Rendon had to go because he's termed out at the end of 2024, and this is kind of a natural time to have a new Speaker uh, elected. So it wasn't exactly a coronation to the speakership or a unified path to it. I think there certainly are some bruised egos and some Democrats who are not feeling too chipper about things. But, you know, now we have the new speaker sworn in and, you know, those assembly members who are still upset, well, they better keep their mouth shut because now Mr. Rivas is in charge of their committee chairmanships and office assignments and things like that. So Brendan's speakership, much has been made about that in the final days of his speakership. And, you know, I think he'll be remembered for the amount of time that he served as speaker, but not much else. Talking with my friends and former colleagues about it, I I couldn't really point to one major accomplishment that Mr. Rendon had as speaker other than his longevity. Um, You know, they made the big effort of they renamed room 317 at the Capitol, which is kind of a press conference room and a conference room in Speaker Rendon's honor. And I suppose that is fitting of someone who has been, he has been the longest serving speaker in the post term limits. You know, as far as accomplishments, you know, if I told you what did Willie Brown do as speaker, you know what he did. John Perez did had many accomplishments as speaker. Fabian Nunez had accomplishments as speaker. Karen Bass had accomplishments as speaker. I, I, I would be hard pressed to tell you other than his longevity, what Mr. Rendon did as speaker. Well, what's your take on Speaker Revis? Will he be more progressive or is he a a plain vanilla liberal? Uh, What's interesting to me, it seems, is that he's in favor of charter schools or he has a soft spot when it comes to charter schools. Yes, I would say that it's going to be a very different style of speakership. You know, I think Mr. Revis is someone you can do business with. I think he will have a bipartisan temperament about him. I think he'll have a moderate temperament about him. So on things like charter schools, he's not gunning for charter schools. He certainly comes up as a farm worker and a, and a child and grandchild of farm workers. So I think on those sorts of issues, he's going to be much more to the left. Not that Mr. Rendon was not to the left on those issues, but it might be more of a priority for him as speaker. Uh, But I think he's someone who is going to have kind of a moderate outlook, is someone you can do business with. But 
That doesn't mean, you know, they're not going to push through left-wing legislation. They probably will do it in a more agreeable way, in a more consensus-building way. The, the other interesting thing about him, allegedly, from what I hear, his wife is much more conservative than he is and allegedly might even be a Republican. So that's an interesting dynamic. And that kind of got caught up in the gossip mill as the speakership battle was looming. You know, what will the influence, uh, what will her influence be on his uh, speech? Speakership, but coming from the Central Valley, coming from an ag community, coming from the real world, I think that gives him a far different outlook than a Rendon who came from a left wing world, from a left wing nonprofit world, from a left wing academic world. So, you know, not to say that we're all of a sudden going to, you know, have the brakes put on very left wing legislation. I don't think we will, but I think there'll be much more of a political realism. Uh, applied to um, the major pieces of legislation that are put through. I think there'll be kind of a moderating influence on what goes forward and the way they go about it and amendments that are taken. Uh, I, I think very much that. I think it's someone who he's someone who will give you an audience who will want to make a deal. But I, I think he will be, though, overall, probably every bit as liberal as, you know, Rendon was as far as the bills that are being pushed through. Now, what about the committee heads? Give us some background on the process. Does he get to choose all the committee chairs? And and how are the new committee chairs going to impact legislation going forward? So to the victor goes the spoils. So the speaker gets to choose all the committee chairs and he gets to choose all of the um, the leadership team. So every, you know, when you're the speaker, there's a whole bunch of leadership um, members like the speaker pro tem, the majority leader, the majority whip, the assistant majority leader, all of those people. Now, obviously, he'll take the audience of his caucus in at making the decision, but all of those uh, and members put in their requests. But those are decisions made by the speaker. So we saw that he's already uh, announced his leadership team. And we saw um, some of the key people who were behind his and supported his um, leadership bid got rewarded with key leadership positions. So you saw um, Cecilia Agriar Curry from the Winters area. She's the new speaker pro tem. She was a key backer uh, of his, and she's a more moderate um, from an ag community. And then uh, Isaac Bryan, who is a far left liberal from South Central LA. He's the majority leader. He's a much more kind of in your face, you know, progressive. He was also a key backer of um, Revis as speaker. So, uh, and then the other one, Assembly Member Matt Haney, who's a new kind of for San Francisco moderate, radical left or anywhere else, member of the legislature. Um, he is the assistant majority whip. So you, you're seeing that key people who were behind Revis's bid got key leadership appointments. Now, as far as chairmanship, uh, Revis has announced he's not really going to rock the boat on committee chairman and committee uh, membership for this year for 2023, but that you can expect he'll put his stamp on it in 2024. Now, that's a normal thing. As we start the last year of a session, members who are termed out or who are going to be leaving the assembly, they typically replace them and get somebody new in as a committee chair. Because let's be honest, everything's about politics and fundraising and committee chairmanships are plum fundraising posts to have. And so so the only big change he did make that was key is that Assemblyman Joaquin Arambula, who was a rival for the speakership and who floated himself out in kind of an erstwhile speakership bid for a time, he lost his seat on the Assembly Budget Committee. He lost his chairmanship of Assembly Budget Subcommittee 1, which deals with um, health and human services issues. So that's where to the, the victor goes the spoils, to the loser, I guess what gets the punishment. It remains to be seen, but I think that's where he'll kind of balance interests. And if there are any rough edges he needs to smooth over or coalitions that weren't behind him that he needs to unite behind him, committee chairmanship and committee assignments are a good way to, you know, get everybody on the same page. Well, thanks for that. So it's always exciting to have a new speaker, Democrat or Republican, and we'll be following it. We've got a few announcements for our listeners in the Orange County and Los Angeles area. If you haven't already signed up, our next speaker is Heather McDonald, who is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. 
Our lunch will be on July 20th on Thursday. Uh, and her new book is called When Race Trumps Merit. And we'll also have senior fellow Lance Azumi moderate the discussion. So I'm sure it's going to be a, a great talk and uh, we can get their take on the recent Supreme Court Harvard decision. And then if you're not going to be traveling or if you're just uh, interested in another great discussion with another new book author, um, we invite you to join us on July 26th at 11 a.m. Pacific time for our webinar with Carol Roth, who is a New York Times bestselling author, television personality. She writes a lot about kind of financial and economic issues. She's a recovering uh, Wall Street person, and she has a terrific new book out called You Will Own Nothing that talks about ESG and all of these kind of issues about government getting involved in the economy and kind of dictating, um, you know, the allocation of resources and the economy. And she'll be in discussion with our Dr. Wayne Weingarten, and it should be a very entertaining, very interesting discussion. Carol is a hoot if you're not familiar with her or her work. So um, it's free to join. Just go to pacificresearch.org to register and we'll be taking audience questions during the webinar. So if you have any questions on these sorts of issues, you'll be able to submit your questions, um, you know, and we'll ask them during the during the program. So join us July 26 at 11 a.m. Pacific for that. So for our next guest, well, folks, it's, it's summer and we thought we'd have a lighthearted, fun interview for this particular podcast. Bill Meehan edited a, a wonderful book of William Buckley's travel writings. The book is called Getting About, and it's it's really a marvelous read. Bill goes through some of uh, Buckley's best writings on his various travels and adventures. Tim, what was your favorite? Well, you know, my uh, I, I'm a big fan of his sailing books, and I've read all of his sailing books. So I, I love the excerpts that he reprinted in here. But one of the things that I uh, was struck by in here was, you know, you you read about Buckley kind of takes up as um, the defender for the everyman struggling through, you know, the nightmare that we have to go through when flying on airplanes. And uh, he has one of the columns that it must have been written in the early early 80s, he's writing about all the complaints that we still have today about air travel, fitting your bag in the overhead compartment, the weight limits, you're not getting any food, or if you get food, it's terrible food, the terrible customer service when you complain about all of this. And I thought, gosh, the more things change, the more things stay the same. So I thought that was very interesting. Well, that's funny you said that because what I like most about this this interview was what Bill had said about um, the practical travel advice that um, Bill Buckley gave, which is get the best value. If you're not happy with a service, speak out. And what I love the most, there's no great time to go on vacation. You just got to do it. That's right. So we hope all our listeners will be taking great vacations with summer and picking up a copy of Bill's book because it's a perfect read when you're sitting by the pool on your uh, well-earned vacations. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And here's Bill Meehan. Welcome to PRI's Next Round Podcast, Bill. Hi, Rowena. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here with you and Tim today to talk about Bill Buckley. Yes, yeah, so it's great to have you today to chat about your book, Getting About, which is a terrific addition to anyone's summer reading list, we think. So for our listeners who may not be familiar with your work, uh, what got you interested in, in writing about and studying William F. Buckley Jr.? And what inspired you to, to put out a collection of Buckley's writings on travel? In, in 1995, I was doing a dissertation on Buckley's first 11 novels. And so my director said, well, why don't you write him a letter and ask him for an interview? No one had really explored Buckley as a novelist. And this was before the Paris Review interview came out in 1996. So on a, uh, I wrote him a letter and he said, sure, set it up through my assistant, Francis Bronson. And so I went up in December of 95 over Christmas break and uh, he gave me 90 minutes of his time. And at the end of that interview, he asked me if when I was done my studies, if I would be his bibliographer. And that's how it all started. And since then, I've spent um, much of my time, a lot of my scholarly work on writing about Buckley, primarily as, as, an, as a novelist. I've reviewed all, all of his books. And so a couple of years ago, uh, spring of 20, I was teaching a course in travel literature at the University of Delaware. And I got this idea for the book, from that course, because Buckley was on the syllabus. Okay. And I thought, okay, this, 
I can work on this over a couple of years and get it out in 2025 for his centenary. But the publisher said, no, let's get it out <laughs> as soon as possible. So that's how it started, teaching a course in travel literature. And, you know, I wanted to do another book on Buckley. This is my third edited volume. And I asked myself, well, what could I do? I, I don't have time to go to Yale for a couple of weeks to go through the archives. And thankfully, all of Buckley's articles are all available online at Hillsdale College. Um, and so I was able to do this from Lewis, Delaware, without having to travel uh, to uh, y- N- N- New Haven. So as getting about shows, travel was a much more common theme throughout Buckley's writings than one might imagine. So why did someone who is so well known for writing about conservatism and free market ideas devote so much of his writing career to writing about travel? Buckley was on the go from early 70s right up to a few years b- before he died. He was constantly in motion traveling. He was a gifted writer and had to write three columns a week starting in 1963. And so he needed to fill some space in, in the columns. And also he found that, you know, he could make some money as a, as a writer describing his experiences traveling around the, the world. He's a gifted writer. There's no doubt about it. And he could tell a good story. And that was the key to his travel writing. He could tell a good good story. And, it, you know, you can only write so much about the political climate. And so since he traveled so much, he made that the subject of a good portion of the articles in his corpus. He feared boredom. So even when he was traveling, he needed to work, wanted to work and liked to work. And so out of this fear of boredom, he wrote about what he was doing on an airplane, sailing the Caribbean at Christmas, or on the Amtrak from New York to Washington's uh, Union Station. So Bill, as readers thumb through your book, they'll see that Buckley's travel stories are are grouped together by decade rather than by adventure. So reading through this, these stories from beginning to end, what do you think the reader learns about the evolution of travel during this period? And and what do you think we learn about the evolution of, of Buckley as a writer and as a traveler? That's a pretty good question. A lot changed in the travel world over the time of, of this book, primarily in the airline industry. So you had the advent of the jet in the late 50s and, and 60s. And then you had uh, deregulation of the airlines, I think in 78. Okay. And after that, that opened up competitive pricing, smaller airlines that would travel in one route back and forth were, were, were started, Com- competitive pricing. And, and as far as train travel, of course, we had Amtrak that came in in the early 70s. And then with that, the Metroliner and then the Accela, which is in existence um, now. And, and then on the water, so we had the growth of the boutique cruises, uh, where they were getting a great return on investment. And it, we saw the decline of the ocean liner cruises. There's still four de- around by Canard, but the growth of the um, short-term, one-week, two-week boutique cruises to select exotic places. So those were the big changes. But the big changes primarily came in the airline industry. And as far as Buckley as a writer evolving over this time, I can't say that he changed any in his storytelling or in his subjects as a travel writer. But as a traveler, I think he changed a a little bit. So he had always a sense of adventure and and discovery. And he saw the vacation as a way to break from the routine of what you do in your job. And he illustrates this when he writes about the vacation, Christmas vacation, when he was in boarding school in, in England. And he was kept up for a week waiting for the day that school let out and he met his sisters in Southampton and got on an ocean liner to go to to New York. He said that he couldn't wait to get on that ship 
with his sisters. And I think that that's what Buckley saw as a traveler. It was a way to get together with your friends and celebrate that friendship. He was fond of all of his friends and traveling for Buckley was a way to get together with his friends, especially like in, when he went to Alta for 20 years with Milton Friedman and Larry, uh, Larry Chickering. It was all about being with two great friends um, in Alta for four days in late January every year. I mean, travel changed, but a lot of things didn't change. You know, the more it changed, the more it stayed the same. Buckley's big complaint was that prices were going up, but the comforts and the service were going down. You know, there was less leg room. There was little or no food at times, sometimes no nourishment at all. You know, he got on a plane in uh, Portland, Oregon, Eastern Airlines, ended up in New York at three o'clock and didn't get a single thing and wrote a letter to the president of the airlines and said, you know, the ticket was $60. Why don't you charge $60 and 50 cents and give me a stick of bread and a cup of coffee? <laughs> you know? So as much as it's changed, a lot of it stays the same. D delays, cancellations, in-flight food service, overweight bag charges. Buckley wrote several columns about the overweight baggage charges and became like the unofficial spokesman for people who were charged, he thought unfairly for overweight baggage. And my friend Jack Fowler, who was the longtime at publisher at National Review, put this in perspective for me the, um, a couple of weeks ago when I was with him. And I hadn't thought about this, but Buckley became the everyman uh, voice against airline power. So the traveler truth to the airline power. And that's, that's the way to look at Buckley as a writer, especially uh, in his columns where he was critiquing airlines, train travel, scheduling and, and delays. So Buckley, of course, was well known for his books about sailing. And, you know, for me personally, they're, they're perhaps my favorites of his books. So why was sailing so important to Buckley? And what piqued his interest in writing so extensively about his sailing adventures? Oh, my gosh. Well, Buckley took up sailing when he was 13 years old in, in 1938, when he his father bought him a 13-foot sail fisher he called Sweet Ice Isolation. And sailing held for Buckley an allure unmatched by anything else. It was the most important sport in his life, followed by skiing, which came late, later in 1955. He was an expert sailor, a well-respected sailor. And it was also getting on a sailboat for Buckley was a time to be with his friends. All right. He has such a fondness for friendship and getting on a sailboat was a way to be with friends. And, you know, Buckley, his novels, as he put it, he's not really big on exteriority. So he doesn't write about descriptions of, of trees and gardens and, la and landscapes. But on a sailboat, Buckley opened up. I call it Wordsworthian. He saw elements in nature and wrote about it in his sailing articles and his sailing books that don't appear in any other of his works in his, in his corpus. So sailing brought out of him an openness to nature and its beauty, you know, and sunsets and sunrises. He even said that, you know, a, a night, a night landing uh, was, was sublime. That, that's his word. And Wordsworth, of course, was one with nature and had this uh, really sublime experience with it. And so Buckley was like that. He doesn't write a lot about it, but it does come out in his in his sailing literature. So there are certainly some, it can only happen to Buckley moments oh. throughout uh, getting about. And there are some moments in time of travel adventures past that you can't partake of anymore, such as his chronicle of his around the world journey on the Concord. Share with our listeners if few of these once-in-a-lifetime excursions at Buckley Chronicles? Well, you hit the big one, that, that trip on the Concord over, over 23 days. Um, and then there were a couple incidents with the uh, U.S. Coast Guard when he was on sailing trips and on one off the coast of Florida, the engine conked out and had to be towed to Fort Lauderdale uh, by the Coast Guard. And then on, on another trip, he hit some shoals off the coast of New Jer Southern New Jersey. And the Coast Guard said, sorry, Mr. Buckley, we can't help you th this, this time around. But I think given the news about the Titanic, um, you know, Buckley in 1987 
went down to the Titanic with this French crew um, in a vessel called the Nautil. I, I think that's how you pronounce it. N-A-U-T-I-I-L-E. Three people went down in this vessel and Buckley was was one of them. And this ship, this vessel, Nautil, is the one that just uh, arrived to help in this search. So uh, down to the great ship, uh, Buckley had a fascination with the Titanic. Um, he wrote a couple columns about it, wrote introductions to at least two books, maybe three. And then uh, goes down in 1987. Um, one of the first to go down. I mean, the ship was discovered in 85. And in this French group, I think had done one other uh, trip down uh, before they got Buckley to, to go on board. And it's funny how that came about. The Connecticut senator at the time, Lil Weicker, had, had introduced a bill that was going to restrict or ban artifacts from the Titanic entering the United States for commercial purposes. So Buckley, the libertarian, said, you know, what, what, is the, what, does the, what right does the government have to get between me and the Titanic? So he wrote a column about it. And that's what attracted this French group uh, to ask him to go go down with, with them. So I think that what's going to happen now is that 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 company will probably you know be out of business for for a while. So that's never going to happen again. And that was a really a once in a lifetime adventure uh, for for Buckley. So reading through the stories, you you get a picture of a Buckley who certainly is an organized traveler. Yet he's often thrown into unpredictable and and in some cases rather chaotic situations. But he also comes across you know as a very congenial traveling companion. Yet he wasn't afraid to take on a a, a Soviet era hotel manager. <laughs> who was trying to take yeah. advantage of, of travelers. So based on your conversations with him and, and pouring through his travel writings for this book, you know, what, what, what would you say was Buckley's approach to travel and what advice comes through from his writings that the novice or the experienced traveler could learn from for their next global trek? Well, there were two types of travel that Buckley did. The first was to get from point A to point B. Um, and that was most of the traveling that he did. He gave, you know, 70 lectures a year for 40 years. And so he was constantly on an, on an airplane. All right. So it was part of his work and part of his life to get from LaGuardia out to Portland, Oregon to give a lecture at a university and then, and then, and then to, to return. The other kind of traveling that he did, and, uh, as I mentioned, was to be with his friends, particularly on a, on a sailboat or on a, on a, a, a boutique cruise. All right. Um, it was a way for him to celebrate the fondness that he had for friendship. But as far as advice goes, he really didn't give uh, write columns that gave advice. It was only one thousand dollars a day. He pretty much uh, it was an economic analysis of why he thought people should uh, charter a sailboat in the Caribbean instead of staying in a hotel. And it came out to be the same price. And he said, you know, if you're on a sailboat that you're chartered, you can go from island to island. You don't have to leave the island. You can go to the beach if you want. You can stay on the boat and read. You can go go ashore. He says you've got complete control over your itinerary. You know, there's always some place to go, he said. But what I gleaned from it was I inferred that you should find the best deal and look for unexplored destinations that make the experience personally rewarding, pleasurable, and memorable. The key word there is, is experience. Um, Buckley thought that if you're traveling, you should be able to have an experience that is going to be pleasurable, rewarding, and, and memorable for you. So Bill, in the introduction of your book, you talk about the evolution of travel writing and lament its reduced real estate in the New York Times, for example. This seems contrary to the fact that people are traveling more than ever before, especially after the pandemic. You've written and lectured about travel and travel journalism extensively. Why do you think we've seen a, a bit of a decline of serious travel writing? Well, I think it's the growth of the internet. Okay, that has helped travel writing, but I think it has hurt hurt it more. It has made possible 
writing, in blogs, uh, websites, okay, uh, not so much in the newspapers and the magazines. And I think there's been a decline in the in the travel writer who can tell a good story. Um, you know, I looked at a few articles this this week, and and they all seem to be formu- formulaic. And then and then and you got to get the ice cream at this spot, and you got to go here for the sunrise. There's nothing there about the experience told in a story that compels the reader to want to go to this place or even probably re- read any any more and you're right travel is is up right now and I, and all reports this week i found said it's back up to pre-pandemic level all right and so is travel writing so the lowell the lowell thomas travel writing award this year got 4 1,838 submissions, which is 30 fewer submissions than they got in their record year, which I think was 97. All right. They also have new categories now. They now have a category for Instagram stories. So you can see where travel writing is is going. They're now giving awards for websites, um, Instagram stories. And I predict that these, these people who are out in the van life and in campers are eventually going to be able to have a category in the Lowell Thomas uh, Travel Writing Awards. But I think it's the decline of, of, of the writer who can't tell a story. And maybe I'm just holding them all to a, a standard that's impossible for anybody to meet. And that's Buckley's ability to tell a story combining the elements of fiction with a superior reportage. You just don't don't find that anywhere. They're all routine and seem sort of formulaic. Now, of course, there are exceptions um, at magazines like um, Outside, Outside Magazine in Santa Fe. Uh, They took 12 awards this year for travel writing, and they're probably the best in the business right now um, after Lonely Planet, which took 10 awards. Um, and, And so there are exceptions around, um, but for the most part, I think it's, um, there, uh, there's no money to send uh, writers to exotic places in any anymore. Um, and so that too has contributed to the decline in qu- quality uh, travel journalism. So Gestad in Switzerland was a very important travel destination for Buckley, one that he frequented virtually every year for a lengthy period to write his latest book. So of all the places around the world that Buckley visited, <laughs> why did Gestad become such an important stop for him personally and for his writing? Yeah, well, he started going there when he was five or six for little vacations. But uh, after he started National Review in the 50s and 60s, he started going o- over there. I mean, I think for the obvious reason, Tim, this was, probably still is, the winter playground for jet setters, all right? Anybody who was, anybody was in Gestat in January, February, and in, in March skiing, all right? Buckley lived, you know, a, a high life. He and his wife had, his wife Pat, had extraordinary tastes. And it was really only one place for them to go. And that was Gestat, Switzerland. He also liked Switzerland. He called it the the way station to, to paradise. But being there in the winter, he was able to, uh, as you mentioned, write, write a book. But also, it allowed him to develop a schedule where in the morning, he worked on national review business, which meant reading um, manuscripts that were submitted or, or editing articles that were about to go to p- publication. Then he would have lunch. Then he would go ski for three hours. Then he'd come back, bathe, and at four o'clock, uh, start writing the book that he, he was working on till seven o'clock. Then at eight o'clock, cocktails and nine o'clock dinner. And after that, it was games or painting. One thing he did in, in Gestalt that he didn't do in Stanford was he painted. He, 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 he was a self-taught painter, oil, oil painter on canvas. And some of the work that I saw of his was remarkable. So Gestalt allowed him to get together with friends that he didn't get together with in New York or in Stanford. One being David Niven, who was a very close friend, uh, was spent his winters over there. And he was at Buckley's house almost every night uh, for, for dinner. It allowed them to host also royalty from around the world at dinners. Um, in Gestat there in the uh, chalet chalet life. So Gestat was really like a microcosm of Buckley's life in, all in all in one place there. 
So, Bill, every traveler loves advice about places they may travel someday and reviews about future travel destinations. Even though some of the stories reprinted in in Getting About were written more than 50 years ago, there are still many observations that hold true despite improvements Mm. in in technology and, and in transportation. What one or two pieces of travel advice from Buckley about travel destinations around the world do you think still holds true today, even though originally offered decades ago. He said, don't plan too much. All right. Because that takes away the spontaneity. All right. If you, if you start planning in January for a vacation trip in August, by the time July comes around, you know, you're starting to get nervous. You might want to change things. And then once you get to the place you're going, there's the element of spontaneity, which gives you a lift that is taken out of it. So don't plan, plan too much, leave room for the spontaneous on a daily basis. The other was, there's no good time to take a vacation. This was his father's subject advice to him. There's no good time to take a vacation. So take a vacation when you feel like you need a vacation. Okay. Um, ask yourself questions like, you know, what are you willing to pay? Why are you traveling to this place? What is it you want to see there or get out of this experience? Who are you traveling with? Okay. Also, I think we take away from Buckley's travels and his writings. If you can do it, go first class, go first class. Um, And two, uh, don't be afraid to complain. All right. When it's appropriate, don't accept any inferior service if you're paying for it, all right? And Buckley was a big critic of the, the service that he, he received at times. But do it in good taste. Do it in, in fun, all right? Um, and so I think those are the pieces of advice we can, we can take away from those 101 articles <laughs> in, in the book. So finally, Bill, we call our podcast next round because of pure eyes proximity to wine country and our love of discussing public policy and great books over a glass of great California wine. So what wine, beer, cocktail, or other beverage are you enjoying this summer to celebrate the publication of your terrific new book? Uh, well, I'm a martini guy, so that that hasn't changed. Vodka martini. But I really, you know, I didn't celebrate the publication of the book. I celebrated the day I submitted the manuscript, May 1st of of last year, only because of what (laughs) the experience of getting it together. Um, The Encounter Books, Roger Kimball accepted the proposal in January. And he said, can you get me a manuscript by May 1st? I said, well, I, I want this book to come out in 2025. He says, no, we need to get it out sooner rather than later. I hadn't done a bit of work on the book other than write the proposal. So I had to get, uh, at first we had 140 articles. I had to get them all transcribed from PDFs into Word format. So I hired two students at the University of Delaware, gave them each 70 articles, and they would send me every week what they transcribed. And then the hard work started. As you probably know, optical character recognition does not work all that efficiently. So I spent hours and hours and hours going through every article, correcting all those Bs that were became H's and all the ones that became capital I's. It was a mess. And that took me up to almost the end of at least middle of April, maybe the end, and left me like 10 days to write the introduction. And so getting that manuscript in May 1st was the deadline. I got it in and a friend who uh, was close with me at, at the time and saw what I was doing, bought a bottle of champagne. And we we drank that together. Well, it's a wonderful book. And <laughs> for those looking for a great summer reading, definitely check out Getting About. Thanks so much, Bill. Oh, you're welcome, Rowena. Th- thank you. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. And when you're on these platforms, don't forget to give us a big five stars. If you don't subscribe to any of these, you can still listen on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.